Uh, thanks, uh, Olympia and the other organisers for um, the invitation to this very pleasant workshop um, and the chance to talk about some of these things in more depth and with more of the players in the conversation than one often has. Um, so my title here and the abstract I wrote, uh, extending it only slightly, is, is something of a hedge uh, because I wasn't quite sure what the talks coming before me were going to uh, be talking about, so I wanted to just... Uh, be free to, uh, to not pin myself too closely to saying anything in particular. But what I do hope to do is to um, at least explain uh, where and why I differ insofar as I do differ from what we've heard already today. And in many ways actually there's perhaps more overlap uh, and the commonality is much greater than one might suppose overall. Um, anyway, and when I talk about some approaches to answering this question, what is quantum information, there are probably lots of different uh, approaches out there that one could talk about. I had hoped to say something about the, um, the relatively new constructor theory of information of Chiara Marletta and David Deutsch, um, but I'm still pondering exactly what to make of that, so I'm not, going to, uh, I'm not ready yet to say anything in terms of that. Um, so there are approaches to the question which differ from what I'm going to talk about and which I'm not talking about here. So it's just some of the approaches to answering the question. Uh, but I want to start off with a general observation or perhaps even a little bit of a warning about uh, the, the structure of the question which we're framing our entire workshop, what is quantum information? Why should we start with a question like that to begin with, with a what is question like that to begin with? Sometimes we need to be careful, particularly as philosophers. Why do I say that? Well, here's one reason. Quantum information theory, quantum information science, if you will, is very clearly a field in rude health. It's going great guns. Um, the people using that theory are all using the concept of quantum information all the time. They're not really running into difficulties in their day-to-day -day practice, proving theorems, making experiments, uh, coming up with interesting new ideas, by um, stumbling over the question of what it is that we're talking about, what is quantum information. Um, so why should we be spending quite a lot of our effort in asking this question, what is quantum information? Isn't it already perfectly evident to all those people who are using the theory? Well, take a parallel case, we've already heard um, this example already today. We all, every day, uh, use the concept of time. We're perfectly, com uh, perfectly competent in, in using our watches, turning up roughly on the time when we're supposed to be knowing uh, when we're supposed to be turning up, having a basic grip on temporal concepts. Um, but when we come to ask, um, to ask what sort of um, understanding do we have of time that goes beyond our ability simply to operate with the concept, what understanding of the concept do we have? Then indeed we do see that there is something and something interesting there. What is time? is a notoriously puzzling kind of question. Um, but it's a second order kind of question. We perfectly well operate on time at the first order level. But we struggle when we then try to have, as well, to express any kind of meta-level knowledge uh, about time. And philosophers, although there are many, many of them working on time, one might say, looking at the variation in what, uh, what's been said about the nature of time, the lack of agreement between philosophers, perhaps even the, uh, the meta-level knowledge of what is time amongst philosophers isn't that great. Um, so if there's a problem about what is quantum information, then at least part of it is that we're seeking a kind of second order understanding of this concept. Practitioners work perfectly well with the concept all the time. Uh, we would like to have some kind of second order or meta-level understanding of what the concept is that they're working with. So that's one kind of <coughs> general point about why we should be interested in the question at all. Um, there's another kind of question though, which is that at least sometimes in the descriptions that practitioners give, the scientists give, of um, what they're doing when they're applying the concept, that is when they try and sell the theory in various kinds of ways or explain what's interesting about the results they've proved in various kinds of ways, sometimes things at that point do seem to go wrong because adequately stating those kinds of um, explanations does require some kind of methodical understanding of the concept that's being deployed. And so one does find, particularly um, early on around discussion of teleportation, some rather awkward and uncomfortable things being said about what was going on in teleportation. See, there seem to be various kinds of puzzles, perhaps physical puzzles, that required new, required new theorizing, as in the Deutsch Hayden representation, to get around. And so that's one of the main interests, well, that's one of the main things that drew me into the, the what is question, first of all, that there did seem to be at least certain aspects of um, the explanations that were given of phenomena by uh, people using the theory, people, uh, scientists using the theory, which didn't seem as if they were quite right, as if they seemed conceptually flawed in some kind of way. Um, so we can be all interested in the what is question just because we'd like in general to know um, what, what the concept is because we just like knowing what concepts are. Um, it's not obligatory to, to know what concepts are. One can live one's life perfectly well 
without ever worrying about the A theory versus the B theory of time, and they want a perfectly good and reasonable life. Um, similarly, what could be a perfect upstanding to information theorists without asking any class question what is quantum information. But we might just be interested in it for our own sake. Um, but if you're just interested in it for, for its own sake, there's a danger amongst philosophers that you just end up endlessly prolonging a debate because, as it were, there's so little at stake. Right? It's, we're really going to have an interesting question when it makes a difference what kind of view one has um, at the meta level about the content of the concept. Um, and so what I'm urging is that there may well be some point at which we should just stop pressing the question, what is quantum information? If we've got ourselves to a level where we've, um, we've uh, resolved some of the, the basic um, problems in the explanations that we have, say, in, in teleportation, um, there might then be you know, different avenues that one might take in detail to say, well, what's, what is quantum information really? This person says this, this person says that. Both of these approaches actually say much the same thing about how to dissolve the puzzles around teleportation. But which of these two is really right? Well, that may actually not be a very good way of pursuing philosophical endeavor, because you may have lost any kind of grip on, a, on an interesting question. Sometimes um, conceptual tidiness is, uh, is good and advantageous, but at the same time, we can, um, as philosophers, because we, we can be sometimes too unconstrained, um, we lose sight of what, uh, what the, as it were, the cash value of doing the kind of investigation we are doing. So a little bit of a warning that it's not obvious necessarily that there is an ultimate answer to the question, what is quantum information, that is going to satisfy all uh, people who'd like to come to a meta-level understanding of the concept. It may well be that we can see some things which it clearly isn't, and there's some clearly wrong ways of thinking about things, and it may well be that we shouldn't push too hard to then decide and really what's the right way of doing things, unless we can show that so pushing does actually do some interesting explanatory work for us somewhere either within the theory or without from trying to situate the, the theory, so the quantum information theory, with respect to broader metaphysical claims about the world. And that's the, the final question, uh, the final reason perhaps we might be interested in the what is question. Because we might take, as many people have done, the advent of quantum information theory to, 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 to be the, the sounding chair for a new kind of metaphysics for the world, an informational metaphysics in which everything is made out of information in some, in some way that this is supposed to be a wholly new ontology for the world. Well, if one's making that kind of bold claim, it better be clear that we know what information is and what quantum information is. Um, and that's a that's subtitle why it might matter. I'm going to say a little bit about how the kind of approach that I advocate towards quantum information can help us assessing those grand and metaphysical claims. I think it's true that um, with both of the previous talks, uh, no, certainly with Ari's talk, um, we've come to the same conclusion, I think, about the bold and metaphysical claims. I'm not quite sure about where things will end up with, uh, with Olympians. So that's just a, a framing set up. Why be interested in the question? A little warning that um, uh, sometimes one shouldn't just keep pushing the question unless you can see what the clear advantage would be. Some approaches to understanding what is quantum information and some axes. What are some axes along which we might uh, seek to investigate the concept or describe the concept to matter level? So we could uh, ask about quantum information conceptually, or quantum information qua concept. So, in particular, we might ask, is quantum information a primitive concept, or is it a defined concept? And if it's a defined concept, then we might ask, what relation, if any, does it bear to the familiar Shannon concept of information? Now, as many people will know, um, quite a lot of, there are quite a lot of statements in the literature which say, quantum information is a wholly new sort of concept, um, and it can't be understood in anything like uh, the, the same terms as classical information. So these would be primitivists about uh, the concept of quantum information. Um, and here's a quote from the Horodesky, sorry, this is perhaps a bit tiny. Quantum information, though not precisely defined, is a fundamental concept of quantum information theory. Um, Richard Yosa, psi may be viewed as a carrier of quantum inf information which we leave undefined in more fundamental terms. Quantum information is a new concept with no classical analog. Um, so these would be primitivists. Um, in Olympia's talk this morning, I guess, um, you would say it's a defined concept, where we start with an overarching concept of information which may then be specialised to the quantum and the, and, the, and the classical kinds of case. Um, I'm going to give a slightly different uh, account of what the relationship with the, uh, the Shannon information is. I do think that quantum information is a defined concept in the way that Ari has described. 
Um, and uh, but I, but I see the connection to Shannon is going rather differently. By the way, it's probably true that if you understood everything in both the previous talks this morning, then much of what I'm going to say is pretty boring and repetitious, because a large part of what I'm going to say is just stating my view, and we've heard other people stating it quite nicely already, so I'm sorry about that if it's, um, uh, things are coming in uh, a bit back to front in that respect. Okay, so that's one axis. We can ask about the concept of information that can be defined. Or we could ask um, an ontological question. We could say, what kind of existence or being, if any, does quantum information enjoy? Uh, that's um, put in philosopher's jargon. What's its ontological status? Uh, what options might we have here? Here's at least four. We could say that um, quantum information is a physical thing or stuff. And one might think that at least some people who are um, uh, asserting the slogan, information is physical, have something like this in mind. Uh, we might call such a view a substance view. Or we might say, well, quantum information is it's sort of a thing or stuff, but it's not like a familiar material thing or stuff, so perhaps it's an immaterial thing or stuff, or a, uh, a quasi-material thing or stuff. It has some, it's a thing or stuff which has some similarities to ordinary material things or stuff, but differs in uh, various other kinds of respects. I think it's some mixture of these kinds of views that one finds in certain explanations of, or purported explanations, attempted explanations of teleportation, which say, during teleportation, it must have been the case that the quantum information uh, that Alice is seeking to send to Bob went backwards in time through the, uh, the, the channel uh, going in the past. It seems like the view that motivates that kind of explanation is that there's a thing there, and this thing, because it's a thing, has to move in a spatially temporally continuous way. Um, uh, but the only way it can do so is if it moves backwards in time through at least part of its history. So I think there are, they won't necessarily get people coming straight out and saying, oh yes, I'm a substance view of quantum information theory. In the kinds of explanations that people give of more familiar aspects, you can see, well, they can only be thinking that because they have this kind of picture in the background, the substance or quasi substance view of information. You might say, okay, um, Neither of the, well, you might, not, might not be happy with the idea that in, in a quantum information is a physical thing or stuff. You might think that saying, well, then it's an immaterial, quasi-material thing or stuff, is at least right in that it's rejecting that it's a physical thing or stuff, but it doesn't go too far. It's no good, well, it perhaps doesn't quite catch it to say, what's well, a kind of stuff which is sort of material, quasi-material. Might, one might say and say, well, no, it's no kind of thing or stuff at all. Because um, here's, here's an analogy from philosophy of mind, if you will. Um, so Descartes thought that the mind was a certain kind of substance, a particular kind of thing, but it was an immaterial thing. Other people coming along later said, no, no, it's no kind of thing at all. Um, so there's an important logical distinction between saying you've got a, a thing-like or a non-thing-like uh, item or thing. Uh, you might have the view that ontologically quantum information is no kind of substance, thing or stuff at all. Even so, one might say, that doesn't mean you have to say it doesn't exist. It's not that it's something which could exist but doesn't, Rather, uh, it, it's, uh, um, the, the category of existence does apply to it, but it's not a kind of thing or stuff. So we could say that certainly quantum information then is, to use the philosopher's jargon, abstract and not concrete. I'll explain this uh, distinction in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, finally, you might just say, look, I've had enough of all this. Quantum information simply shouldn't be thought to exist at all. I'm um, going call this view nihilism. Uh, and there have, I think, at various times been opponents of, of each of these. My view lies here in the middle, um, and we could call it a deflationary kind of view. Um, Nihilism so, is meant to be derogatory? Uh, not necessarily. Well, well it, it's, it's certainly strong. Okay. It's certainly a strong view, but, but some people could think, you know, it's great to be a nihilist, just think how bold and... Um, okay. well, what, what exactly is the sense of that, uh, that sense of nihilism? Uh, so it's the denial that quantum information exists. So uh, it's just a restatement of that? Yeah. It's just another label. Uh, okay, so my own view uh, on the conceptual side, as I say, I think quantum information is not a conceptual primitive, um, and I, as I see it, both quantum and classical information can be seen as different, seen as different species of a single gas. Um, and on the ontological side, um, I think it's right to conclude that quantum information is no kind of thing or substance, um, so it's an abstract um, uh, entity. So call that deflationary view ontologically, but there is importance to distinguish two kinds of cases. Ari mentioned uh, this distinction. So on the one side, we have the, uh, the quantitative side of the concept of, of, of Shannon information or quantum information. We're talking about how much information. Um, 
And on the what we might call the content side, we're talking about pieces of information, the pieces of the, the messages, pieces of channel information or quantum information that might be transmitted. Both of these things are abstract, but in different ways, importantly in different ways. So that's my overview, and I'm going to try and explain why, um, notwithstanding what we heard this morning. <laughs> No, you have to start the sentence with that. Not that was standing what we heard this morning. This idea that I'm maintaining is the right point of view. Good. Uh, okay, good. So, uh, right. So this uh, is a familiar kind of picture, but there's an important difference with the picture that um, Olympia put up this morning. You can spot the important difference. Sexist. There are stick figures in it, and the didn't have any. Right. To the left and, to the and, and reflecting on um, Ari's talk from earlier, what might the stick figures signify? Subjectivity. Or at least users. <laughs> users. <laughs> users. Living users. Um, users. Users. So. We're revisiting the Shannon concept here. Why do you want to revisit the Shannon concept? Because it's part of my claim that in order to understand quantum information theory properly, quantum information properly, you need to go back and make sure you understand the Shannon theory properly. And it's surprising to my mind how um, ill understood or partially understood, as I see it, uh, the Shannon theory is. This is the point that, uh, that Larry made earlier on. So I want to go back and make sure that we understand what's going on. Here. Make sure we understand what I'm going to tell you how I think we ought to understand what's going on here. Um, and that will allow us then to see the connections to the quantum case. So, again, the famous quotation from Shannon, setting up the, uh, setting up the idea here. The fundamental problem of communication is that of reproducing at one point, over here, a message selected at another point. Frequently these messages have meaning. These semantic aspects of communication are irrelevant to the engineering problem. Now, I think that the significant difference between the way that I think about things and the way that Olympia and her colleagues are thinking about things, is that I see a much greater distance between that ordinary concept of information and the ordinary concept of communication, the semantic and epistemic notions, than they do. So, although we have the traditional warnings that we have distinct concepts from the semantic and epistemic side and the channel theory side, um, I think a lot of our difference between the views that we had this morning and what we'll hear right now is um, is that I just see the Shannon concept as lying far further from the basic, from the, from the everyday notion of communication than you do. And that ultimately is going to be my answer to the question of why I'm not worried about how the transmission of the quantum state would count as communication. Because I say an information theory, and paradoxically a communication theory, is not at all about communication in the everyday sense. It's not at all about it. And thinking it in those kinds of ways is what blocks an understanding of the quantum concept in parallel to the, uh, the classical concept. Um, so there, there are very significant differences between the, the everyday notion of information and the uh, everyday notion of communication and the, and the Shannon theory ones. Um, and too often, I think, still, even when you're sensitive to some of the differences, even when you're sensitive to some of the differences, I think still elements of thinking that come in from uh, the everyday concept of communication uh, come in in ways that I don't feel correct. Okay, so we have Alice. She's identified um, some message or some kind of message that she wants to send to Bob. She's interested in how she might efficiently go about doing this. If there's a probabilistic structure, if she can identify some kind of probabilistic structure in the message that she wants to produce, then uh, that she wants to send, then she can compress the output of her information source and pop that into a channel with a lower capacity than she'd otherwise need to use. And we have over this side, um, we reproduce the message over here. At further distance, can you see any of the um, subscripts on that? Just in that. Well, this, this is some particular sequence, x2, x1, x2, x something, x8. And we imagine a particular sequence of symbols coming out of being produced by this source with a given probability, and then it's being reproduced over here. So, in this setting, we have we introduced the famous Shannon quantity, the minus sum p log p, p of x and log p of x r. Uh, and the way I want to put it is that um, this quantity just is defined to be the compressibility of the output of the source. And if we say, well, why should we call um, uh, why should we call this quantity h of x information? It's because it measures compressibility. Um, so it's not information in the ordinary sense of information. Uh, it's just um, 
if you're interested in setting up some kind of communication system and doing it as efficiently as possible, um, and then if you're interested in how much have you got at one end that you need to get to another side, the pertinent sense of how much is just what's the minimum resources that's required. So the, um, the, the notion of amount has nothing to do with um, what might be learnt from the message or uh, how, how important the message might be or what the message might say about how the world is. It's just about um, how much it can be compressed. Um, and it's called an information because the overall setup we're thinking of as providing a process by which what Alice cares about producing can be reproduced at Bob's side. So the overall setup is an information um, protocol, it's a communication protocol, but at the level of the theory that we're deploying, the Charlie theory, we're not describing um, the, the purposes of the communication protocol, what, what Alice and Bob care about, why they're setting it up in the first place. We're trying to characterize what's necessary to underpin what they want to happen. What do the, the, what do the cogs or the wheels, the nuts and bolts underneath have to be like? in order to get this um, uh, process that we're interested in producing, for some reason, the theory remains silent on, to work. Okay. So, we've got the Shannon quantity, H of X, um, and then we get it characterized as a source. Why should we call it an information? Um, and this is my attempt to, again, to characterize some of the differences between, um, I think, Olympia and her colleagues positions and the, and the kind of position that I uh, that I want to work you for. Why should we call the Shannon information quantity? Why should we call the Shannon quantity H of X an information? So granted we do call it an information, but why do we call it an information? And should we call it an information? What reasons might one give or reasons <coughs> somebody given? Uh, I'm just making up a bunch of labels, um, so we'll see whether these are useful labels or not. So one could have a, a view that might uh, we might be labeled Shannon epistemicism that says that well, the reason that H is an information is because, in fact, H is also a measure of uncertainty. In particular, you know, H of X is a very nice measure of the spread of a probability distribution. And so you might say it labels my, um, you know, shows how much I know, um, given that I know the probability distribution about what the results of the measurement might be. Um, and then because we have, uh, the, the, the more uncertain it is, the more I stand to gain, the more knowledge I stand to gain, from determining what the outcome of the, uh, uh, of the experiment would be, or determining what the, uh, what the system produced, what state the system produces, and then I have more knowledge, so then there's more information. So HX becomes uh, a measure of, it's called a measure of information because it's a measure of uncertainty. That's a standard kind of textbook line. Or you might say, well, if we don't necessarily want to, to work with the, uh, the, the spread of the whole probability distribution, we might want to look at the uh, um, an epistemic notion for single outcomes. And they'll say, well, this, this quantity, checking minus the logarithm of the probability of some event, is a nice measure of how much we're going to be surprised by that event, and thus uh, how much we might learn from it. So the more we learn from it, the more information it conveys. So here in the Shannon, Shannon epistemicism view, we have an answer to the question, why is this an information theory? Because we have a tight connection to the everyday epistemic concept of information. A different kind of view, and I think I could be quite wrong, but I think this may be what lies behind Olympia. Your take on things is what we could call Shannon primitivism. That is to say that we're just going to stipulate that minus log kxi is an amount of information produced by the accounts of a given event. It just is. And there's no further story that can be given as to why this quantity should be called an information, why it should be this quantity that's an information as opposed to any other one. Um, and then this is the worst label, but this is the view I think is actually correct. Shannon substratumism. Oh, so again. Shannon substratumism. Um, and this is the view that I was trying to articulate a little bit earlier, which um, says that, look, bear in mind what the Shannon theory is really about. It's not about the purposes that Alice and Bob have in trying to communicate with one another. It doesn't actually characterize um, the, messages, the messages they want to send to one another um, at the level of why that should be something that they want to send to one another. It merely characterizes what machinery you need in the background, the substratum, for bringing out whatever it is that they want to do. Now, if, if what they want to do is communicate something to one another, then fine. This is going to be the machinery that you need underneath that's going to allow that communication to happen. But the terms in which that machinery is described the terms of the Shannon theory, are not themselves to do with the purpose for which 
the machinery is constructed. But they are not set in necessary and sufficient conditions for doing whatever it is that Alice and Bob want to do. So it's we call the Shannon H and related quantities an information called an information theory only by proxy. It's an information theory because not because it's about information that Alice and Bob want to send to one another, but because it's about the behaviour of the machinery, as I put it earlier, the sort of backstage cogs and wheels that are required in order to bring about what they want to do. So Shannon information theory is not really about information at all. But we still call it an information theory because it's about the behaviour of the machinery that you're going to need in the background to do your tasks that you're interested in. Okay. So why is epistemicism wrong? Why do I think epistemicism is wrong? Uh, the wrong way of approaching this question. And bear in mind, the question we're asking is, you know, why should the quantity H be called an information? I think that's a question that we need an answer to. Well, uh, here's the, the cleanest argument that I've been able to construct, which is that the concept of measure of uncertainty and the concept of channel information distinct because there's a property which is true of one which is not true of the other. Namely, that um, H of X is unique as a measure of compressibility, but it's not unique as a measure of uncertainty. So, in fact, Josef Fink has a very nice discussion in his 1990 PhD thesis of a whole range of different measures of uncertainty which can be parameterized by um, a con single continuous variable, of which the Shannon is only one. Uh, and there are lots of uh, somewhat conventional restrictions, even to get you down to a one parameter family of measures. So the Shannon information quantity is far and away, the, the H of X is far and away uh, not unique as a measure of uncertainty. But it is unique as a measure of, of compressibility. And I came that compressibility is a perfectly good information concept. Um, when we're in the, um, the substratum view of things information that characterizes the requirements of the substratum. Um, and similarly, we might say, if you want to work with the individual surprise information, or the individual information elements, how much we learn, um, then in general, minus log P of Xi, the event Xi is going to be inadequate as a measure of how much we learn, because how much we learn ought to be a function of what we learn, um, but what we learn is quite independent of the probability that a given event has in general. So it can't be that the right way of understanding um, the shallow quantities is via the epistemic means. Then, as against the primitivist route, the problem here is that I just don't see here an answer to the question that we started with. The question was, why is this an information? It's not an answer to that question to just say, it is. Um, what warrants the use of the term? Uh, okay, how long were we talking about half an hour? So this is, this is the, 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 those different approaches where I'm trying to put, uh, uh, put my finger on where some of the differences we've been seeing today are coming from. Okay, I want to go back briefly to the story of bits and pieces. This is just fleshing out some of the ideas we've had floating around um, already today. So to reiterate, I see there are two importantly distinct sides of the Shannon concept. Um, uh, and um, there's the quantitative side and the, con the content side, and this is often missed in discussions. So on the quantitative side, we're concerned with the question, how much information, we have a little subscript T here to indicate that we're talking about information in the substratum sense, about the characterizing the behavior of the, the, the machinery you want to do a job for you. This is the story about bits of information, or a uh, number of bits, if you want to make this distinction between a uh, unit and, um, uh, and the physical thing that you're using to encode on. And on the content side, we have the story of pieces of information, what information. And we're often told that uh, this, there isn't an answer, on the, one of the differences between the everyday concept of information and the Shannon concept of information is that there isn't a content side to the Shannon concept of information. I think that's wrong, um, and the kind of story I give has been mentioned already today. Um, what are the messages produced when we characterize things at the level that the Shannon theory is operating, so at the level of the substratum? They're long sequences of distinguishable states in the classical case that are produced probabilistically by the source. Um, and it's these that are going to be the pieces of shallow information I maintain. And then importantly, we have this ontological distinction. One of the reasons uh, we want to be clear about these concepts of information is to be clear on the ontology, if there's a new ontology in the world to be found. Um, the piece of shallow information is not to be identified with the systems that realize or instantiate it, because um, there's a difference between, the general, between objects and their properties, a logical or metaphysical difference. Um, and correlatively, there's a difference between uh, tokens and types. I'll explain that a little bit more in a moment. 
coming back to the abstract versus the concrete distinction, which is a key part of the story here, so for people who aren't already familiar with this stuff, um, abstract versus concrete is a philosopher's term of art. Um, abstract is only defined as the negation of concrete, and you get a grip on the concrete by example, essentially. Um, so concrete particulars uh, include all those things which provide our basic um, semantic, epistemic, and causal inter uh, connection with the world. So tables, chairs, and people are all kinds of concrete things. Um, there are other kinds of things we come to find out about later on, which are also concrete. They're not our immediate um, epistemic and semantic uh, access to the world, but we can find out about them. Atoms, electrons, and things like the electromagnetic field are concrete too. Um, these are all concrete particulars, uh, or concrete stuffs, by contrast to things like water, wood, or gold. This ontological um, distinction also goes with a, a grammatical distinction. So concrete particulars would be uh, named by concrete countdowns, and uh, concrete stuffs are named by concrete mass nouns. But the salient points here that we draw out from the examples are that concrete, uh, concrete things typically are spatially temporally located, or located, or at least roughly. So electrons aren't going to be perfectly located. located. They can be broadly pretty well localized within pretty small regions. I've said that a lot. Um, concrete things are also causally active and can be acted upon, and they're more or less directly observable. So, of course, we don't directly observe the electromagnetic field, um, but we can uh, come to uh, extremely well grounded belief that it's there. Uh, and then, as I say, we just define the, um, the abstract as the non concrete. So, examples of abstract things, if I want to talk about things at all, could be numbers or sets or propositions or um, what's named or possibly named by abstract nouns like justice, honor, truth, beauty. Those will all be abstract things if they're things at all. They're certainly not content of the material world in, in the way that tables and chairs are. So the point here is really to emphasize this kind of ontological distinction. Um, and then here's a very simple-minded view about the nature of the world. The world is the totality of things. Um, now we won't say everything that there is to say about the world if we just say what things there are in it. We need to talk about the properties that those things have, uh, intrinsically in what relations they stand into one another. But that, you know, that's the world, the totality of things, and then there are facts about um, how they stand. Um, of course, this is the directly opposite view to um, what Wittgenstein asserted in the Tractatus. He said um, the world is the totality of facts, not of things. But luckily, he um, realized his error about 15 years later and said, no, I had that completely wrong. It's the other way The world is the totality of things, not facts. Um, here we're relying on a distinction between objects and their properties. And this is important in understanding the ontology of information. Um, so in general, we want to distinguish um, a thing itself from what's true of it. So my shoe is black and on the end of my foot, um, but the blackness of my shoe is not on the end of my foot in the way that the shoe is. Um, the shoe has a spatial temporal location, but the blackness of my shoe doesn't. It's the shoe which is located the properties it instantiates are. Um, the properties, in general, all pro properties are abstractive, for each, so they're not concrete things or stuff. Notice in this technical um, application of the word abstract, we shouldn't confuse it with um, notions of idealization. And if we think of, sometimes we talk about processes of abstraction whereby one comes at some more and more general thought, that's a different notion, a different sense of abstract from this abstract concrete distinction. Um, so more and more idealized descriptions of some situation might be more and more abstract descriptions of some situation by a certain use of the word abstract. That's not the use of the here. Here, abstract versus concrete is an all or nothing affair. So a corollary straight away, if we have them, some metaphysics in mind, uh, something we're aiming for. Uh, so given that the Shannon quantity is a quantity, it's a property, it's not a, a concrete object, then it's, by definition, Totally abstract. In the way that any property is abstract. Like the blackness of my shoe or black is abstract because it's property. Because it's property, not an option. One might think that some properties are more familiar, blackness, solidity, and so on, might be more familiar kinds of properties than um, uh, more recherche properties that one might find in physics. You know, something like maybe charge or even something like mass is a quite highly um, theorized concept. But it's not that the physical properties are more abstract, that the, the properties cited in fundamental physics are more abstract in this sense of abstract than properties like black, uh, spherical, hard. Um, again, the abstract distinction is binary. 
it's all or nothing. It's not that some things are in this sense of abstract, more abstract. Okay. With types and their tokens, I'm suspecting that everybody has already got this because we've had uh, lots of this today already. What's the distinction between types and their tokens? We introduced this standardly by using a linguistic example. This is how Peirce came up with the um, distinction in the first place, one of Chris's uh, favorite philosophers, uh, Charles Sanders Peirce. Um, in ordinary language, in the description of language, sorry, we make a three-way distinction between, say, I'm writing some sentence down, the cat is on the mat, uh, oh, I'm going to even write it down. So, we make a three-way distinction between um, the actual ink on the board, the inscription on the board, of the inscription of what the inscription of the sentence in English, the cat is on the mat. Um, I could write the, the same sentence again, and so on. So there I've got two things, two different tokens of the same type. So there's clearly something similar between these two. What we say is similar, or one of the ways that we introduce the concept of type is by saying that these are both tokens of the same type. You have two physical instantiations of some abstract thing. Um, then we might also say, well, there's something else here. Uh, what's, what's Spanish for the cat is on the mat? El gato está. El gato está. Anyway. So I just made up a language. Um, I just made up a language which, which I expresses the same proposition. <laughs> right, so the point is that, again, there's, there's, um, there, there can be something similar between um, different sentence types on a particular occasion of use. Different sentence types could express the same proposition. So a three-way distinction. For our purposes, we want to say that the token, there are three tokens here, um, and there are two types. There are more types that these could fall into as well, but there are at least two types here, um, two types different type sentences here. So the tokens are the concrete things. Um, at one level of um, description, we have this sentence type in English. We have this misbegotten sentence type in the other sentence. Um, they're all expressing the same proposition. Now, similarly, for our purposes, when we're looking at the Shannon case, we need to distinguish between the, the piece of Shannon information, which is just the sequence of states that we require this piece of machinery, or that this piece of machinery we're interested in produces, um, the, the output of that um, machine, that which requires to be reproducible, is going to be the type, um, and so that the piece of Shannon information is abstract. It, the tokens of that piece of information are the actual um, uh, systems which take on the various states. Those are the tokens, <coughs> and they're different. So now we've got the, the second conclusion. Earlier we concluded that Shannon quantity of information was abstract because it was a property. Here we have Shannon content information is uh, abstract because um, it's a type. Notice, and this is one of the many ways in which one can say that we're the distinction between the Shannon concept of information and the everyday concept is that there's nothing like the notion of proposition express comes in here. We just have the, the concrete token and the type of instantiates. And moreover, that in natural language, the sentence, and indeed in fact any language, sentences will have some kind of grammatical structure, uh, syntactic structure. The outputs of Shannon sources don't even have syntactic structure. They just randomly produce. But for syntax, you need rules. OK. Now we come back to an area of important agreement between my talk and Harry's talk. This is what the role of Alice and Bob, um, the stick figure Alice and Bob's, were. What determines the types of interest Alice and Bob do? Um, how would we characterize what's being produced by the source of your parts can be produced? It depends what Alice and Bob are interested in achieving. Um, and so at this point that I want to assert that going back to Olympia's example from earlier on, this morning with the, uh, the dye and the light, I'd say those can perfectly well ca both count as tokens of the same type. If Alice and Bob have got together and said, Look, the only materials we've got to make our communication system are, I've got this dye over here, but it's, you know, my mum has told me I'm not allowed to take it out of the house, and, uh, and, and Alice is in the house next door, and she's got an array of beautiful lights that she wants to use, and say, I've got to use these lights today, um, I've been dying to use them, let's make a machine with these lights. They could set up a system whereby it just is the case that the flashing of the lights 
for them, it counts as a token of um, the die's uh, token at the same time as the die is being face up. Yes, it's conventional, but then, you know, if it's conventional. That these two are both tokens at the same time. So, and this is something we'll have to talk about further, Ari, but I, it seems to me that a lot of what you're saying with the representation and the user stuff, um, and the kind of thing you said about tails and heads, was very consonant with the way that I'm thinking about it. So I, I still have to understand why um, you want to resist my thoroughgoing allow allowance for conventions. Now, there may be plenty of those conventions as constituting types. Now, there may be plenty of cases in which um, we are Alice and Bob are pretty constrained and don't have to and don't, don't need to, maybe can't. There'd be no purpose in coming up with particular conventions. But I, um, but I don't see why you can allow a convention completely free reign to characterize the types of interest. Um, there might be a further remark to make about um, the metaphysics of types in general or abstractor in general, uh, but no, let's not talk about that. Okay, what determines the type of interest? Alice and Bob. I think that's perfectly natural when we put them as the users of the system, then they determine, uh, they determine what's interesting. So, to reiterate that from the substratumism kind of view that I'm articulating, the channel theorem doesn't tell us anything about the purpose of setting up the communication channel, it's silent on that. And thus, what type the message is, as characterized by the channel theory, and what counts as successful reproduction, are determined by, by the users, Alice and Bob. Um, and here's a nice little uh, descriptive term one can use for this. As I see it, information theories, or descriptions in informational terms, in terms of information theory, are adventitious, they're of the nature of an imposition from without. The world doesn't come painted in informational terms. Alice and Bob, and us not, are peering around the world, and we choose to describe certain systems in informational terms, often because it's a great idea to do that. Okay, quickly now, applications to quantum case, otherwise a bit waffling on. So, these reflections, ruminations, lead me to discern a general pattern, and uh, Ari mentioned this, uh, a general answer to the, what is information question and information theory, at least an information theory of the Shannon strike. It's true that there are completely diff different paradigms of information theory, e.g. Komogorov, which we heard about this morning briefly, but at least an information theory of the Shannon type, the substratumism Shannon view. And so information, little subscript T, to remind us that we're, not talk we're talking about something the no -no, something new. Information is what's produced by a source that's required to be reproducible at the destination for transmissions to be counted as success. Um, and so far, I may be persuaded by these control examples, but so far, I'm perfectly happy to just import whatever level of convention is required. Um, no, not, that's, that's, that's too irrational. Whatever is required to make it work. It seems to me, <laughs> it seems to me I'm not yet persuaded that I can't have as much convention here as, as, as I want, and it's still be useful thing to say. That may change. Um, now this obviously is a very general definition. The details of the source and the criteria of successful transmission need to be specified. That seems to be all of a piece with the idea that Alice and Bob, or Alice's and Bob's, get to decide the, um, and what the, the theory is for and why it's interesting. Then in the, in the quantum case, we just start with the Schumacher notion of the quantum source. I think it's interesting to note that the, the fact that Olympia and Sebastian did this morning about what exactly Schumacher said in the 95 paper. Um, as I mentioned, I think um, there's enough evidence, internal evidence in that paper to think that he had a quantum source in mind, as opposed to just the quantum coding. Um, maybe there's some more evidence from the, from the um, quotation that Chris went out. But also there's a further point, namely that, although it's important to go and look back and see what the originators of some uh, concept or some notion did with it and how they described it, that won't be a completely determined thing. So how other users of the term also use it. And I think it's pretty ubiquitous just to think of quantum sources as quantum sources, not just as quantum coders. Um, and I guess this is a, a point that, that Larry captured in that definitions need to be uh, consistent with a complete range of standard uses of the term. Okay, in the Schumacher case, the direct comparison would be that a piece of quantum information is now a sequence of states produced by a quantum source which we re wish to reproduce at the far end. Okay. So, conclusion. Pieces of information, both quantum and classical, are not part of the material contents of the world. That's a metaphysical or ontological conclusion. The tokens are, the types are not. So information is not physical. Uh, these pieces of information are not physical. It's not a kind of stuff postulated by an information theory. Um, 
what does this mean for a piece of information on mass physics? Could the ball be made of quantum information? No, we wouldn't need tokens along with the types. Um, it's a category mistake to assert that information is physical. Oh, well, either it's a category mistake or it's just trivial. Okay, it's a category mistake if we're talking about pieces of information. Pieces of information because they're abstractor, um, because their types are abstractor, but these need to be instantiated with physical things. Um, if you say, no, no, I don't mean pieces of information, I mean information quantity, well, then to learn that some property or some quantity that you can define physically is physical, or physical property is physical, is a trivial kind of reading. Um, so, category mistake or trivial. The real content of this phrase, of course, is that it's a methodological one, it's not an ontological one. It's suggesting a particular way of going out and engaging with the world and trying to look for distinctive things you can get quantum systems to do for you that you couldn't otherwise do. That's methodology, not ontology. So we have some conceptual conclusions, we have some ontological conclusions. Um, I wish to maintain that quantum information is not primitive, it can be defined, uh, and moreover that quantum and classical information are indeed species of a single um, it's important, though, in, within this that we distinguish between the Shannon quantity as a measure of information and as a measure of uncertainty. Um, and I've suggested why I'm unhappy with a primitivist approach which just says H of X just isn't information. I want to hear some more about why it should be called an information. On the ontological side, um, information is not a kind of thing or stuff at all. Uh, it's not a kind of thing or stuff postulated by an information theory. Um, information is a quantity. The number of bits required to encode is a property of the source, hence as abstract as any property is. Uh, the pieces are types, they're also abstract as any types are. And stating information as physical boldly is just a category mistake. Uh, and I think that was all I wanted to say. Thank you. With, with your closing line, Roth Landauer's cask. <laughs> Questions or comments? Hmm. Yes. Well, I, I think we started with the pretty convincing. Uh, I was only wondering about the blackness of the shoe. Ah. I, I mean, blackness is not there, of course, but it seems possible to maintain that the blackness of the shoe, I mean, the, that the shoe is nothing but blackness and, and other things, and a bundle of properties. Would that make a difference for, for your analysis? So, uh, so the, it, it wouldn't make a difference because there's still a difference between the bundle, the object, and that which is bundled. But I would rather stay out of traditional metaphysical disputes about the nature of object and property. I don't think they're terribly well motivated. Um, but even in a bundle theory, you would say there's a difference between a bundle and that which is bundled. Okay. Okay. Um, but I'm happy even if we just say, <coughs> staying at the level of ordinary description of things before we start importing various pet metaphysical theories, there just is a difference between objects and property. Um, information, quantum information lie on one side, and qubits lie on the, and classical bits, c bits lie on the other side. Okay. Let's there are a couple of things. Uh, I mean, uh, if you say that information is what is uh, used in certain theory, for instance, the channel theory. I think that it's not primitivism in the sense I, I decide to call this in this way. Uh, theories have a history. So, for instance, if you say force in, in physics, perhaps in, at, at the beginning it was something uh, related with the effort made by biological system. Mm -hmm. But then, when a, a, a word entered uh, the science, it is, it is elucidated in a more precise way. So in that moment, it has some uh, origin in a, uh, in a concept of or, or a term of the ordinary language, but then it acquires a technical sense. So it is not principally to say that information is something that is what is measured by the, the, something that is measured. I mean, as first pieces, I have no quantity. And information in a technical sense has quantity. I mean, 
So point of information does. Yeah. Yes, but I, it's part of my picture that yes. we can perfectly well talk about the shadow case of voices yes, too. Yes, my point is that the other kind of information is not in the in the theory, it's not explicit in the theory. It's more comes from the uh, ordinary language or the regulated yeah, so, so, so what I'm calling pieces of Shannon information you're asserting aren't in the Shannon theory. This is, point goes in the same sense that when you say that something is adventitious, mm -hmm. uh, because you say, well, it is not part of the world. It's something that I use because I can. I have to use better some resources, some physical resources. But it, it is not really physical. In the history of physics, it happens with other uh, concepts. And the, something similar like an authentication uh, concept, like something that measures the, the how I like, can make it work. But then, now, I think that we cannot think uh, physics without energy. And energy has a, has a great problem when we <coughs> want to uh, say which is the ontological category of Energy. Well, we can well, discuss from here we, we, to for so, so should we pause at that point and deal with a couple of those points and before moving on? Okay, to but the, 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 my final point is that nobody says energy is not physical. It's not something that is a content of the world. Even if I don't know if I if so it's so a thing or a substance so or a property or, so or energy, what. Energy is not a physical thing. Energy is a physical property. And we can draw uh, the. So I don't know. But it's a physical. <laughs> this is the point. So it, it seems plain to me that energy is a, is, a, is a physical property. It's not a physical thing. The only thing that could possibly lead one to think that energy is a physical thing is if you're confusing, if you're in a field picture of the world, whether a classical field or a quantum field, and you're confusing the field with energy. But energy, um, a patch of space time will have a certain energy density in it because of the amplitude of the field, quantum or classical, that's in it. So the field is the space feeling locatable, it's the thing. The energy is a function of the, um, uh, of the amplitudes of the field. So there's, there's no element of physics that could possibly lead one to think that energy is a kind of stuff. Unless you're in a caloric theory, in which case the concept of energy wasn't as articulated in the way that we have it nowadays. And you might nowadays, um, and it didn't have the same kind of connections between thermal behavior and mechanical behavior as we've developed over the years. So if you might think of caloric as a, as a kind of um, energy as a stuff, that which flows when heat flows, because it's energy that flows when heat flows. Um, but that can't possibly fit the concept of energy you have today. Anyway, that's a, that's a sort of a side issue. There are two more important points. Uh, I may have forgotten the second one, so you may need to remind me. So your first point was that um, it's a perfectly legitimate way to introduce a term into scientific discourse to, well, it may pop up historically in some way or other, but then it's embedded in the theory, and that theory has certain practical uses. And so we can determine what the um, what the content of that concept is by looking at the way in which it's used in the theory. Okay, so I look at the view which says that um, I've got this source which produces certain systems and certain states probabilistically, and it produces an amount of, of information. And it still sounds to me, well, why call that information? What can you say about the structure of the theory in which that description of the source is embedded, which pins down minus log PI as an information concept, or something that we ought to call an information concept. Now, with forces and so on, we have a, a story, you know, perhaps we got the original idea of forces from kind of pushing and pulling and springs and so on, and it was generalized, and what's what expressed by certain kind of uh, laws in a Newtonian setting and so on and so forth. With forces, we have a general theoretical structure, where, because of the richness of the structure, we can get down to the level of description of particular ph phenomenal goings on, um, movement of pendulums, whirling of the planets around the sun, and so on. We can say, look, this is a gravitational force, like Newton, we're not going to give a mechanical account of it in terms of springs or a medium or anything like that, so we're losing that historical uh, aspect of, of pushing and pulling, so it's just become what's in the, in the force laws. Um, but you can see that the point of calling it a force is just, you know, a force is that thing which connects with acceleration of mass in a certain kind of way. Now, what's the point of introducing an additional concept out of nothing, as it were, in, the, in, in this particular case. So my view, um, 
there is a role for the concept of information because you're talking channel information because you're talking about compressibility, and you need to talk about compressibility if you're in the area of trying to design optimal communication systems. If you're not needing to talk about compressibility, why talk about this new quantity information which isn't traditional information, isn't ordinary information at all? What's the connection between the phenomena that we actually see and we need to use the theory for that warrants calling this thing an information? It's like it's a free wheel. We would lose nothing if we called it something else. If we just called it, yeah, I don't know, um, uh, rumor, say. It's the amount of rumor that's produced by the source in this rumor theory. Well, I, I wonder if perhaps it was the same, people was saying the same about energy when the, the, the concept of energy was first introduced in physics. I mean, uh, perhaps now you are right, but I mean, I'm not sure, or, or I would not like to say what physics will evolve with the concepts. I mean, um, it is not enough to say that this is not a physical concept or that this is the um, structure of ontology. For instance, you are very tired with an ontology of individuals and properties. But we have so many problems, ontological problems in physics, that perhaps an, an ontology of properties or an ontology of facts it's better. So, uh, so, we, so I don't think there are actually any ontological problems in physics that could possibly be helped by any familiar metaphysical toolkit. So some people want to say, well, quantum field theory is so weird that maybe we need to do things in terms of tropes. But that seems to me markedly to misrepresent the content of quantum field theory. There seems to be nothing wrong at all in quantum field theory with just saying the fields are the entities, or if you don't like fields as extended spatial temporal entities, um, just take points of space-time and, uh, and have a field values being properties of those points of space-time. There's, there's absolutely no core, I know, no, I know no good argument for having to rule out any other peculiar metaphysics and the standard. So certainly the objects are slightly unfamiliar by the, the realms of ordinary everyday experience, but they're still logically objects. I see nothing that um, pushes us away from that. But I think there was a, there was a second point you had after the, after the, um, for the primitivist approach and um, before the energy becoming um, being, a, being an example of uh, well being a questionable ontological status what I'm saying it's a clear ontological the same in general so okay, same. Okay. <coughs> yeah. well, I just want to make a comment about information it's physical I, I don't think um, uh, Landauer ever meant by the slogan information is physical that information is a kind of stuff. Um, I think what he meant, as far as I understand, it is more or less what you meant, that uh, information uh, has to be tokened, if you like, or instantiated in physical systems, and so we have to, we have to worry about the properties of the physical systems. I mean, one talks about quantum information versus classical information, yeah. which which suggests that information is physical, you know, in, in, in that sense, not in the sense of stuff. I mean, some people might think of information as a kind of stuff, but certainly most of the people working in quantum information or classical information, you know, don't think of it as stuff. Well, that, may, that may be an instance of the general future, but I don't think that one's going to categories very much at all. I mean, I think if one takes a, um, a maximally charitable reading of Landau, it's just... And, 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 okay, just a charitable reading, but really the, the point is just a methodological one. Now, if you forget the way that he's trying to make his point. His point is that the laws which govern the behavior of these uh, things and what's going to be true of them about the information theory of them is going to be different. So we have to attend to the, the physics of information. That's a methodological point, not an ontological one. Saying information is physical is just a very, very bad way of making a really excellent methodological point. Oh, okay. And then some other people run off, and, and uh, but perhaps, but sometimes giving these kinds of talks, they give a bunch of crazy quotes by serious people asserting that the world is made of information in various kinds of ways, and they will often support that view by saying, modern well, science has shown us that information is physical. Well, that's certainly true. I mean, there are a lot of uh, serious people who do say that explicitly. 
uh, Lutko Vidral, for example, in that popular book of his, uh, explicitly says the world is made of information. And yeah. it repeats it several times. But he, he, I doubt that Lutko, I mean, as I've got to a colleague of Lutko's and I've talked to him about this, I don't think he'd want his official serious view to be what one would read in the popular book he wrote. So we shouldn't um, spend too much time analysing that particular book for um, insights about how people, when they want to be careful about it, are really thinking. Uh, uh, you were next in the queue, at least. Um, yeah, uh, just an observation, uh, at least at the same time, question of what is all about this. I was thinking uh, on the original paper of Shannon, when he says something like, well, we're going to start and we need a measure of information, so it is convenient to start with this one, and he puts uh, logarithm, and he, he then poses a uh, uh, he defines the kind of definition. This is for several purposes. We have this definition and so on and so on. So the way I see that kind of working, and, and he says explicitly that he's continuing the work of Hartley and another guy. And he says he's continuing. And there was already a notion of information and information transfer, which was intuitive. And so they used uh, different information measures for different purposes. So my remark was, when you go to coding, uh, you mentioned that uh, in coding, uh, Shannon information was unique. But I just want to remark that if in your coding setup you have penalties, for example, you say, okay, it is convenient to, uh, I mean, and frequent words, uh, I will put them in large codes. But it may be that it may be the case that you have a limitation in your memory, so you need to put some exponential cutoff, and, and then when you, you do the computations, uh, there's a paper by Campbell, and he shows that the more convenient uh, entropy to measure that kind of coding is uh, a raining type entropy. So there you see that uh, also coding depends on the particular context that you are working on. Mm. So uh, I, don't, I, I consider that if you, if you just say, no, information can only be measured with the optimal code in this particular coding way, what? I see yeah, that, I'm, I'm what I see is that you have an intuitive notion yeah. and, and then you for, you have different purposes and for some purposes channel information is quite good and but for some of them maybe you, you need to to use another dispersion measure yeah. which could be a rainy entropy or something else and, and in, exactly the same happens with the coding case. I mean. I'm, I'm more than happy to allow lots of different notions of information. My main thought is just to attend to how they're defined and what, look, pay close attention to what the concept actually is and don't confuse it with others and don't confuse it with the everyday concept of information. So I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to, to allow lots of different concepts of information which may uh, overlap more or less and may more or less warrant the name. Um, I think the first part of your comment stroke question had a slightly different thrust though, didn't it? So um, when you were talking about Shannon uh, building on the previous work and um, there was another point I thought you were making which was that... Um, it was continuing hard in Yeah. Um, Oh, yeah. So the, the, he gives reasons the, the, for defining information in such a way. So I, the, the, the main thing I take away from the early bits of Shannon's book, well, there's an important bit where some after he begins the axiomatic characterization, because he has the wordy bit at the beginning where he talks about some of the history, uh, and, and then he moves to the axiomatic uh, derivation of the form of the Shannon information, gives a, a uniqueness argument for the quantity H effectively as a measure of uncertainty, is that argument isn't quite right. Um, and he says, this quantity has got lots of nice features. Um, but then he says, but actually, um, the real use of this will be in its application to coding. So there's this whole nice discussion, and James, for example, may not always made much of this um, putative uniqueness argument for the form of the Shannon uncertainty. Uh, Shannon himself wasn't really bothered by that. I think he thought it was nice mathematics. But the real meat comes when he says, but the, the, fun, the, the, the real value of this, this quantity will come in its application, and then he gives the proof of the, the coding theorems. So but, I see you, sorry. Well, I was going to say, but, but his point, I understand your point, 
because I was going to make it myself if I had time. So I'll, I'll, I'll run with it anyway. You see, at the point where, where Shen stopped the, the general introduction and started with the meaty bit, as you say, he says, now what we're really interested in is coding. And here is our measure of a good code. The, the, the average length of the code word. And then he proves the theorem, the, the, the Shannon coding theorem. And H comes out as the unique answer. But if at that point, if, if Alfred Rennie had walked in and said, no, I don't care about the average code word length. I, I care about the average of the square code word length. Then Shannon could have proved exactly the same theorem, but the answer would have been the Rennie 2 entry. So it may look like there's not so much arbitrariness so there's a lot of arbitrariness at the beginning of the, the talk about uncertainty measures, which Yoss has, has really pointed out. Uh, and not so much arbitrariness in the coding theorem, but actually there's an equal amount of arbitrariness if one considers these other measures. So it's just a pedantic point. But I don't think that's a good, a good argument for supporting your non-epistemic interpretation. You need a different argument. Yeah, yeah, sure. No, that's, that's, that's helpful. And, um, so this, yeah, so you get the uniqueness out if you say this is how I want the to measure um, compressibility, what might it's more compressibility, but we might, particularly if in, in looking at real cases of coding where you're never going to be working the infinite limit, um, you might want to have various kinds of trade-offs which push you in a different direction. This is true. One last thing, or I think what I just said, we're just already over time very briefly. Just just to follow up on Jeff. Um, where it matters, is, you know, it, it's not as though uh, physicists just already knew all this stuff and um, nobody had that kind of silly view that information is a substance. But in the early kinds of explanations of teleportation, you get these very much substance needs to be transferred type of responses, uh, which indicates that their thoughts were not so clear in this matter. So, um, that was it. Just uh, I, 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 uh, perhaps it, the problem is not that they think that they that information is stuff or, or the, the, the problem is the idea that the information needs a carrier, a, a space-time carrier. This is the problem. Perhaps it's a, it is a property, not a stuff, but the property of something that has to be transferred spatial temporarily. I mean, this is, uh, and so you can uh, let aside the stuff view and you still have the problem of I mean, if you need a carrier, you still have the problem. I, I think. Yeah. One last one, because this is the last talk. Just, and <laughs> just a second. Okay. And, and you're finally stuck. A lot of motivation. I mean, we are here discussing what is quantum information. And at the beginning, you argue why this, this discussion might or might not be interesting. And my point here is that in some senses, so from many perspectives, it's, it's, it's not just interesting, but it's actually urgent. For instance, in foundation of quantum theory, after the advent of the so-called quantum information, many people have devoted uh, their efforts in, uh, I mean, Chris call it reconstructions of quantum theory from different sets of axioms. There's a completely different community trying to unify quantum theory with, with gravity and gradients and things. And for this, from this perspective, having a clear answer of what we are talking is, is important because it decides, I mean, it's, it changes the, the perspective of what kind of principles are acceptable, what kind of principles are, are acceptable. So I'm just trying to introduce here a, a sense of urgency in answering in, in trying to get answers to these kind of questions in, in five years or so, because we need these kind of things to really push science into the right way. So two quick comments. Um, so first, many reconstructions don't actually use any concept of information whatsoever. Um, and second, those that do probably, I don't know many that actually use the concept of quantum information. So they might be inspired by information theory or information yeah. processing tasks of one form or another, but that's actually just completely separate from having to know what quantum information is. Thank you. And this is, well, this is a different thing, because you still have to answer some questions or some 
And it, if I understood correctly, his statement was this kind of subjective degrees of belief can constrain the agent's expectations, but cannot constrain what is possible. Right? What you said? Yeah, that wasn't a complaint to Chris Thompson. It was a complaint to Chris Thompson. It was a complaint to Chris Thompson. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, but you agree with this? I never agree with anything. But it's talking about this. I mean, can this be used somehow uh, against cubism? Um, and I'll try to address it tomorrow. Okay. In, in, in my session. Yes. My, my guess would be the answer would be that cubists will believe that such and such is optimal compression, and they'll act as if it is, and, and uh, they'll be very surprised if it doesn't turn out that this is a good way of compressing. Because it's, it's the general story. All right, let's call the session closed. <laughs>